Good evening and welcome to the scheduled meeting of the Milford School Committee. Today is Thursday, October 10th, 2024, and this meeting is being broadcast and recorded by Milford TV. Copies can be obtained at the request of this board or through the central office. We'll start out tonight with announcements, correspondence, and distribution. Any members have anything for that? Yep, I've got two, Mr. Chair. Um, I just returned from reception for the Community Foundation of Metro West, a big <coughs> supporter of the Milford Public Schools. At that event, one of our teachers, Nilda Arroyo, was prominently featured for her work with the Metro West After School Math Tutoring Program, which the foundation supports. They kind of showed a video, and she was probably in about five minutes of the 12 minute video. It was great. Um, I want to thank both Nilda and Carrie Taylor for their work on getting this program off the ground. And the early data is very positive on the impact of this program, and we hope to expand it to seventh grade next year. Um, the second thing is um, this evening, our own middle school principal, Dr. Caridad Lopez, is being honored by the Globe magazine as one of Massachusetts' 100 brightest Latin leaders. And this ceremony is taking place at the Boston Museum of Science. Again, it's wonderful to have one of our outstanding principals recognized um, as a statewide leader. So, very excited. And that's what I have. Those are my two announcements. Awesome. All right. We'll move on to invitation to speak. Uh, I see no one here for that, so we can pass over that one. Look, gets us to the Shining Star Early Childhood Center tuition increase. Hi. Documents linked on our agenda for uh, everyone's reference. So I believe the committee was um, given the proposal beforehand, so that should be in, in your documents. So I am here um, to talk about a tuition increase for the preschool. Um, so I, I'm, I'm here to request, I'm here for two proposals, one for an increase in the overall tuition for all of the programs, and a second um, proposal of an increase for the afternoon sessions. So in the packet that was sent to you, um, this suggested um, amount for the increase in tuition um, for a span over the next three years um, for your consideration is either 10%, 15%, and 20%. Um, I did the breakdown for each of the sessions there and what it would look like incremental over the next three years. And really the ask for wanting to increase the tuition is um, costs have risen and um, the, to, for the sustainability of the program. And even with this tuition increase of either of those amounts, we are still um, very well below the surrounding towns for the integrated preschools. And that's, and I just want to be clear to those watching at home, it's not 10% per year we're talking like. No. It's 3.3% per year over three years, basically. 3.33% over three years. That's, mm -hmm. that's an important point. Questions, comments? Uh, trying to start is great. Thank you. Um, what does the money go towards? So the money is allocated towards um, instructional supplies. Um, it's certain areas, instructional supplies, um, uh, behavior assistant um, salary, and um, part of it goes towards my salary as well. Um, the our administrative assistant salary um, and transportation um, on the special ed side. So, question potentially um, is so in our budget right now. So, are we does the, the fees cover all that right now, and we're in danger of it not covering it, or? I don't think we're not we're not in danger of not covering it. Our numbers this year are actually higher for our tuition paying students than they were last year. Um, but I think Wen could speak more to that than I. Uh, yeah. Uh, so percentage of a course salary, PA substitute instructional supplies, house supplies, contract services, and some some classroom expenses are covered by the tuition. So transportation. Teachers' salaries for um, clerical and the special education aid. Um, office supplies and other office costs are under the general fund budget. 
So what I'm getting at is, do we need to increase the price? Right, so if, if, if we're covering the budget now and it, it seems fine, you know, is there a need? So that's what, what I'm trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I would say is that when's the last time we raised tuition rates? So I was here in 2019 I with a request, it. yeah, <laughs> um, to a very similar request as this was to raise it over three years with the increments of 3.3 and um, the committee recommended a one year increase. Um, I believe it was like a 7.5% increase and the ask was to come back um, if the tuition needed to be revisited again so so the last time we've done an increase is five years ago it's 2019 you said mm -hmm. right yeah so five years ago is the last time we increased it and i think the the, the issue is is the the costs are going up and we just cover more of a percentage of the budget from the general fund basically and that's what so, i'm trying to figure out yeah i mean i don't think I, again i don't think that if you know you say hey we, we don't want to do an increase this year it's 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 going to be gloom and doom necessarily, and I've said gloom and doom a bunch related to the budget, but I don't think in this case it's necessarily gloom and doom. But I think what happens is over time, more and more of the costs of you know running Shank Star follow the, follow the general the general fund the general account is what happens. So I think you know again it's the committee's um, it's at the committee's uh, decision, but. Um, I think a 3.2% increase based on where we stand compared to tuition, both the private providers as well as other integrated preschools, you know, we're, we're a very, very affordable option. Mm -hmm. Good for now. Uh, Robin, you guys got okay. Robin and then Brennan. I apologize if you said, I'm just trying to follow along with all the numbers, yes. so I apologize if you already went over this. What proportion of the students at Shining Star are actually paying tuition? Um, so 50%. Okay. So 50% of our population do not pay tuition. So I think that's important for us to consider when we're looking at these numbers because we're not even, there's always going to be 50% of the population of Shining Star that we are covering as a district. And so right now we're talking about the other 50%. And I don't necessarily hear that we would expect them to cover for everybody. I think there's, you know, this portion that we're going to need to cover as a committee and as a district but thinking about the rising costs and I'm so mindful of this and and I you know conflicted myself mm -hmm. as I'm having this discussion but just thinking about extended day rises in cost every year right so just you know to stay consistent and still be well above other options considering the budget year that we're currently in and possibly going to be in in the future I Think we'd be remiss to not even consider it, especially knowing we're always going to own the cost for 50% of the students. I've got a question. Um, hold on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, with, with that, with this increase, would we see an increase of students who would not be paying? Like, so for example, would that, if we go up 5% per, if we choose to, would we see more students, like, would that number go 50% to 55% who would not be able to pay that? that uh, fee anymore. So uh, let me answer that one. Yeah. So th the way this preschool is set up is 50% of our students are students with disabilities. Okay. And they're funded basically through the Chapter 74 Got function. It. And there's, there's a whole kind of formula for that. Gotcha. So that's not going to change. If there's 50% who pay tuition and choose to come to Shining Star, there's 50% who are basically referred from, um, why am I blanking on the Early name? intervention. Early intervention, thank you. From early intervention um, that, are, that were required to you know educate and, and kind of serve their individual education plan, okay. basically. To so kind of put it very coarsely. So the increase is that knock anyone... It's not going to shift the percentages at <coughs> all in terms of who pays and who doesn't. Okay. It's just going to basically be a reflection of, um, you know, just the rising costs. That, sure. Because you know, every year our budget goes up. Of course. Um, just because things are more expensive than they were the year before. Yeah. And I guess the second question to that would be, do you have a recommendation of the 10, 15, or 20? Would I? Yeah. I do not have a recommendation. Okay. Does I would I would make two recommendations here yeah. to, to consider. Sure. One would be to look at the ten percent over three years. I don't think I'd go much above that. Okay. I would recommend going much above that. The other thing the committee could do is say, hey, let's do a three percent, or let's do a three and a third percent this year and see how it goes, and not not put it over three years. Okay. I, those are the two options I would put on the table. Again, it's it's up for your discussion, but. Um, I think both of those are reasonable considering the last time we asked for 
an increase was five years ago. Thank you. Thank you. So um, where I'm struggling is that we don't have any numbers to kind of gauge this off. So how much revenue will this raise if we do 10% or 3% year over year? Do, do we know? About so, 10%. yeah, I don't have those numbers offhand because it depends on the sessions. Of course, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess my, my thought is, is um, I mean, Shining Star, I, I love it so much, I would like to make sure it's accessible to as many people as possible. So raising the price, I'd like to see the price stay the same or even go, go down at some point, right? <clears throat> but if we need to raise it because it, it supports a program, that's fine too. But it's hard, hard for me to make a decision if I don't know, if we're raising the price, why, we, why are we raising the price? Obviously, prices are going up, but there's, no, there's not a lot of data behind this. Like, so I, I guess that's where I'm struggling on making the decision. I, I don't want to just raise the price just because we should raise the price, or we think we should. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so usually, <laughs> in a business, right, if your expenses are going up, you say, hey, my expenses have gone up 3%, and you know, there's a 50 grand deficit, so mm -hmm. I, I gotta raise my, my revenue, right? And so right. that's what I'm looking for, is we're saying we wanna raise the price, but I, I'm not hearing we so, need to raise the price for X, Y, and Z. So I would say, can I, can I just respond yeah. to that? And then, yeah. um, I, I would say that what it does is it lowers the liability that the the broader budget has to cover, basically. And I don't know if, Wendy, do you have the numbers <coughs> of the impact or no? The at your fingertips? Of, of like a 3% increase or a 5% um, increase? I think it's in the 200,000 ballpark each year. How much is raised so total for tuition? 10%. Yeah, okay, so, so it's about 200,000 that comes in for tuition. So 5% so would be 10,000, 3% would be about 6,700. That makes more sense. So we're talking about like a ten to twenty thousand dollar increase mm -hmm. per year, probably less. Well, it depends on what percentage. Okay. If you decide on go, raising the tuition at all. Sorry, my first thing is of a seventy million dollar budget, <laughs> right? So um, appreciate you coming in to, to present. I'm actually, you know, I think I'd asked about this a couple of years ago because I think you know, 2019 was obviously five years back, and why we hadn't really visited this I know COVID hit things of that nature so and obviously costs have gone up um, but also I get, well basic questions when would we implement the, the change if 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 we were to do that um, 25 26 okay not until next year which I assumed um, I guess with that you know let's just say we it's a, a 5% increase whatever like 5% on $100 or 5% on $1,000 is a big difference in how you look at it. So again, kind of to Mike's point, we don't have all the information. Like what exactly is the current tu tuition? And I know there's different <coughs> sessions and different tuition rates. So I think I, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit that I don't have all the information in front of me. Um, I'd like to know what the history was before 2019 because I know there was a gap there. At, in 2019, we did that jump, but I don't necessarily know what that jump was. So feel like we're missing a lot of information right now I know I understand costs go up and I understand that possibly you know a three percent per year is, is, is probably a, a good idea but I don't know how that fully affects the parents that are paying again is what how much is three percent so right now I'm, I'm at a <coughs> pause point where I can't really say I want to go forward with any percentage because I don't know what mm -hmm. it is and, and even right now we don't even know what how much so extra revenue we're generating right you scroll down you can get the, month, the yearly is it I, I you know what did I miss that then yeah I, I missed it initially too it's, I did too then yeah it's down. thank you yeah so yeah it, I mean like it can be upwards of like 500 bucks a year per yeah. per student so I have to apologize. I didn't realize from, all from, this. I thought from, this from was thirty dollars a yeah. year to five hundred dollars a year yep. is the range. Go ahead. And you'll see the blue represents right. the ten percent with the three point three for the first year, then the second year, then the following year. Okay. John. Thank you, man. So I mean, there's a reason we charge tuition for this program, right? Otherwise everybody would be here doing it. So um, I agree with pretty much what everybody else said. We do need to have a better understanding of the numbers, what what we're bringing in, and I know they're here, some of it is here. Um, so I don't think this has been a complete analysis, but if we're offering this program and we recognize that there's a need to charge for this program, 
we have to recognize we can't charge 2019 rates going forward. So I, I think the consensus here might be that bring it back a second time with a little bit more data and explanation. And I mean, I would support it, but um, it, it does seem a little blind to say, okay, let's go uh, 5, 10, or 15 percent or whatever the 10, 15, or 20 percent tonight to make a decision on that. Is Shining Star currently at capacity? Is there a wait list or are there openings? We have three <laughs> spots um, left in the preschool. If we were to raise tuition, do you anticipate we would have more than three spots open in the preschool because we'd be pricing people out? I don't think we'd be pricing people out because we're so much less expensive than the area preschools and the private preschools um, and also the other integrated preschools. So I don't, I don't foresee that being an issue with enrollment for our regular ed students. And do we offer any type of tuition assistance if there are families who do not have a child with special needs who do need support with tuition? We currently do not offer tuition assistance. Okay. And that maybe would be something to consider if we raise prices? So I, um, I have two thoughts on this. Number one, just for reference, <clears throat> going by the number for five full days that we have now, I can tell you through painful personal experience that that is about a 60% discount compared to um, private places in mm -hmm. town. So, um, and the other part that I would just share is, I understand the need to offer the service, and I know Shining Star does excellent things, but I, I would support an increase in tuition. Um, I know it may not be a lot of money, but the operational budget, for the most part, is in play to cover and support the grade levels that were required to provide as public school service. So I love Shining Star, and I know that even offering something on scrolling down quickly um doing the 10 percent, so three every year you're still at pretty close to the ballpark of a 50 percent discount from a private place um so getting a little more help especially knowing that um kevin's in pain over our budget um needs is uh, consistent, pain. consistent pain would be would be beneficial but i agree with everybody else too i'd like to see a little bit more so we can decide of the three which one makes the most sense to uh balance both affordability and uh and what you guys need so with that are there any other thoughts or comments John just to pick up on Robin's point if we're gonna consider aid I, I mean I think we need to get uh, you know Zach and Jerry and Ryan involved because you know we have that anti-aid amendment law that we you know we've talked about in the past and if we're gonna consider something like that we need to make sure that everything is done in proper order and whether or not it's even allowed. And I, and I think if we did offer like like free tuition to families that you know were economically disadvantaged, which we have a large percentage of in town, I think that would be that would that would bring a net negative to the right. to the to the proposal. I just didn't know if there was anything for families that qualify for free and reduced lunch. If there was anything, there's, there's vouchers for preschools, mm -hmm. but we're not. Um, part of that process and okay. we looked into it at one point mm -hmm. and made a decision not to go forward with mm -hmm. it and I, and I can't remember why because it was a while ago mm -hmm. but that, that was something we did explore at one mm -hmm. point I want to say it was pre-pandemic I know that yeah. for sure I can't say how far be beyond the pandemic it was before the pandemic mm -hmm. it was but it was probably more than six or seven years ago when we looked into it yeah so if there is a system in place it might just be worth looking into again especially if we raise <coughs> tuition that's all yeah, if I can. I'm not suggesting we don't do it. I'm just suggesting that if we do it, we make sure we mm -hmm. yeah, do course. it right. It's the right mm -hmm. amount. Yeah. We do have a program for our families in Milford where it's free tuition for preschool. It's the SMOG <coughs> program mm -hmm. in um, Medway. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pause for the formality, but I have a feeling there's no motion coming to adopt this today. So uh, we'll leave it off then, I guess, with we'll get this on an upcoming agenda in the next couple of weeks or so or next uh, not next couple of weeks the next couple of meetings if you guys if that's enough time to pull a little more together or when you're ready you can obviously bring it to us i know you don't need to have this wrapped up right now so so uh, i'd suggest that that we convey the information we want them to compile sure. for us to you and you coordinate it with them so that we're not bringing you back with yeah, out some sort of direction let me note that, that down sounds good. that's a great suggestion <laughs> I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm off. Now I'm not on board anymore. All right. Um, so 
Thank you for that. While I finish taking those notes, we're going on to the uh, report, Pat. We are. Um, Patty Reed, our curriculum team coordinator, is here to talk about the report card that the teachers have revised this school year. Yes. Hi. Um, I think you all received copies of our proposed report card and our current report card. So this came about because it's been about 10 years since we um, that we've had our current report card and since then we have new standards that have been <coughs> written and adopted through the state. Um, those standards are the approaches to play and learning standards which are very important at the preschool level. So we decided to you know um, write a new report card to reflect those changes and we ha currently have two report cards one for our younger population who are three and four and then we have a second report card for our students who are four and five in their pre-k year so the following year they'll be going to kindergarten so you'll notice if looking at the two report cards that the we changed the format so it looks a little better and is easier to use but um, as far as the third the three-year-old report card three four-year-old report card that one has the most significant changes to it we added a lot more um, of the social emotional learning and uh, approaches to play standards to that age group because that is really what is very important at that age if they're not able to you know do those um, basic skills then they're not really going to be ready to learn more of the ac academics that occur in their second year of preschool um, so we did keep a, some of the same things and added more social emotional learning and approaches to play um, as for the four and five year old report card it is still very similar a lot of the same skills on our current report card are on the proposed report card there have been a few um, changes where we may have combined some of the skills um, to make it make more sense to our families and easier for them to read and understand where their children are at developmentally um, both report cards our proposed one and our current one are based on our state standards and you know, provide our families with the information that they need to know and understand about where their children are currently at Shine and Star. Um, what else did I want to say? Okay. We also added on some of the um, standards, some, you know, more examples so parents know what we're looking for on the report cards. Does anyone have any questions? I don't know. So for a four-year-old, yeah. which report card do they get? Good question. So if you're a young four and you still have another year at Shine and Star or in preschool in general, you would get the three, four okay. uh, report card. The older fours who will be turning five and moving on to kindergarten would get the four and five-year report card. Okay. Now, thank you for all this work. This, you know, going through this makes sense to me and looks nice. Um, procedural question. Do, does school committee vote on these? I don't believe so. Is this just for our our information, Kevin? I believe so, yeah. Okay. I think it's just great. informational and for you guys to ask okay. questions. Great. I'm, 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 like, I'm not an expert on this, okay. so I'm like, why don't we? <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Thank you for all the work on this. You're welcome. Thank you. I just have one more question about sure. just, so the four and five report card looks very comprehensive, very good. I just mm -hmm. have, and just, out of curiosity is a couple questions about the three and four year old one if that's sure. okay um, and this is purely for me comparing the old one to the new one um, I just yes. noticed like under social emotional I know that there's several different um, categories now where before the only one was how well a child separated from the parents but that's not one of the categories anymore um, so I was just gonna ask about that and then also just some more of the pre-academic skills like identifying letters things like that um, just the decision to take those off okay so for the um the one about separating from parents. We realize that parents know whether that's happening or not, mm -hmm. so we didn't feel the need to oh. report on it since 
it's typically a parent or a grandparent mm -hmm. that's dropping off that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we thought that was just kind of redundant, redundant. to, mm -hmm. you know, keep on the report card. And then as far as identifying um, letters, that is really more, if you look at our state standards, that's mm -hmm. really more of a skill that it is for the older fours and fives. Mm -hmm. So while they're still being exposed to all mm -hmm. of that, good academic things at that age, we're really more concentrating on them to be able to know how to be at school mm -hmm. and be ready to learn. Because if they're not able to sit, attend, mm -hmm. be a good friend, be kind, all those good skills, they're not really going to be able to be ready to learn um, the academics. By taking out some of those more, I guess, I'm calling them pre-academic skills, yeah. but just like early literacy skills as mm -hmm. something that they're being graded on? Do you find that teachers are able to offer more opportunities for free play for the kids in the classroom at all? Yes. Okay, so that's a very good yes. thing. And that's like the change we're trying to go to with those younger kids is okay. just offering more free play because there's so much that we can do through free play. Okay, that sounds good. Anyone else? No. Thank you very much for <coughs> presenting and bringing this to us. Appreciate it. No real questions, but just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much for coming and presenting all of that. Thank and we will you. reach out um, soon with the information we're looking for. Sounds good. Thank you. Move on to the transportation update. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Hello, man. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me again. Everybody has the uh, packet that uh, Jim handed out. When you're ready. So, um, just the, the 30,000 foot view at the moment is transportation is <coughs> kind of in the same situation we were at last year, last time when we spoke. So, just a couple of data points by way of comparison. So last year, I think when I came in, we were at 100 or 102 students towards the end of the year. This year, we've started the year at about 102 and growing. Um, we're looking at about um, the same uh, homeless number. So our MV numbers are about uh, 290 to 300. What's MV again? Uh, McKinney Vento, uh, homeless. NB, okay. Yep. And so our... We're actually at 307 for... Um, 307, yeah. And just, I also want to preface that some of these numbers are moving targets because, you know, kids come and go. Um, but to Kevin's point, 307, uh, which kind of puts us back in the same ballpark that we were last year. Um, from a resource perspective, we still kind of have um, the same vehicles, same drivers we had last year. We haven't added anything net new. Um, so we're trying to cover a lot of the same ground with the same resources that we had. We did take on uh, some additional yellow busing routes, um, you know, which absorb some resources on our end, uh, but we're trying to make accommodations to hire um, one or two drivers to compensate for that moving forward. So it ends up being kind of a two-pronged conversation regarding how do we manage uh, effectively a growing in-town in population of 102 um, and how do we manage the rising costs of out of district, which are currently, you know, in the low to mid 50s? Um, we do have um, we do have a waiting list for out of district, so we do intend to see that move uh, a little more north as the year goes on. So a little too early in the year to talk about <coughs> whether or not or where we're going to peak for out of district. I mean, when Jim says we have a waiting list, it means not waiting list, it but means there students are, are waiting to be placed. We have, we have a, we have a I'd say somewhere between probably three and five students that are waiting to be placed in private placements that will be receiving out of district transportation at some point, yeah. probably in the next like couple of months. No, 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 no. They're being placed through the special education process. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so this time around, too, we did some comparative analysis. So we spoke to some DART and non DART related districts. Um, DART data is, uh, Robin may be a little more familiar with that, too, is districts that the state. Um, identifies as comparative districts to Milford. Um, some of them are a little more technically compared to ours. For example, Revere is one, but when you look at Revere, they have 350 out-of-district students with a $5.5 million budget, and we're certainly not in that ballpark. Um, however, they are facing a lot of the same issues. We spoke to Revere, Bellingham, Marlboro, 
uh, Douglas and Barnstable. Um, the most comparative districts that I found would be um, Marlboro and Barnstable. They're in the same um, overall budget category. They're in the same student with high need, student with disability. Uh, the only thing that varies there is the ELL percentages, which you know are, are just basically a demographic. Um, you know, in speaking to those folks directly, we spoke to the business managers. Um, all of them have experienced budget impact and budget increase. Um, by way of example, uh, Douglas had a 21% increase year over year of the last two years. Um, they have a total out of district population of 13 students. Their costs went up 21% this year, transporting the same 13 students. Uh, Marlboro has a one to 1.1 to 1.2 million dollar budget and has seen a $700,000 increase in addition to that for the last three years, year over year, for roughly the same 55 students that they have been transporting. Um, Barnstable's in the same bucket, um, $1.1 million budget transporting 39 students, and we are budgeted currently at, I believe, at nine or 950 transporting um, 52 students. So when you do the cost per head, actually, we're one of the lowest. <laughs> I uh, know that's not what you want to hear, Matt, way to but that's the, that's the math. <laughs> that's <good. laughs> but, it, but it makes sense. Thank you for yeah. sharing it. Sure. Any questions on that piece? Yes. Just looking at the numbers, so I'm looking at the out-of-district spend versus the local. Are any of, I, I'm seeing our out-of-district is going down. Are any of those getting converted to in-town local? Ben. I'm not, I, I can't add that. I'm okay. not sure what the conversion would be on that. I mean, have we seen students come back to the district? We have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it would be a significant number, but mm -hmm. there are students that have transitioned back to Milford. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even from an MV perspective, we've seen students that have lived in other districts or other towns, rather, that have then relocated back to Milford. Mm -hmm. I would say um, those numbers are more driven by students aging yeah. out, either they're graduating <coughs> from high school or they're turning 22. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that they're moving to one of the other graphs, per se. It's no, a, okay. no. It, and that number will go up over the course of the year. It always okay. does. So mm -hmm. I think the numbers that Jim has are kind of the end-of-year numbers. Okay. And we'll probably yeah. have... Mm -hmm. I, I, we could still end up being less than last year, mm -hmm. but, but there's a chance we could be pretty similar to last year in terms of total numbers, too. Which is, you know, it, it's it's driven by the IEP process mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a lot of different variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, thanks for presenting. Sure. Um, if we looked at your overall, you know, budget and network and cost, really, yeah. the budget's been a moving target. It, it from more from a pie chart, it, you know, are you able to, you know, kind of put that together where you say, you know, this is our local yellow bus transportation, this is our spend in town transportation this is our sped out of district transportation just to kind of get an eye sense of overall budget impact right or from your transportation of where those all that money is going to so yes yes and no i guess i guess i'd probably have to pull when into that because when we talk about in district spend so those are going to be our that's going to be our payroll our vehicles which have been amortized over the last five years um so Getting an in-district number, I mean, I have kind of put together a, a kind of a variable in-district number just to see what we would look like for a daily rate. Mm -hmm. um, so we can provide some of that information, but some of that is going to be very difficult to say, hey, you know, what's our payroll for our in-town drivers for an annual, you know, for a school year? Mm -hmm. um, and then how do you factor that into the vehicle costs, fuel costs, et cetera? So I do have a rough... I actually do have a rough operating revenue model that I can share with you on that that will give you an idea as to what our total cost of ownership is for in-district SPED. Um, and then out of district SPED, obviously, we can provide a lot of information because we, we have PO history and we have you know receipts right. history, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yellow busing, that's going to be a little difficult. We can calculate the daily rate for a yellow bus per route, but that's the Vendetti contract, and that's going to be extrapolated over a three-year Three three year contract. But that's a pretty yeah. fixed cost. Yeah, it's say, a fixed cost. The yellow yeah. bus. That's why. I feel the only like the only variables there, Chris. If I could jump yeah. in, is um, is like you know the the like athletic trips, field trips, right. things like that. That kind of make that add a little bit of variability to that. But like I'd say, ninety five to ninety seven percent of that is pretty predictable. Right. Which yeah, and I will say even though yeah. like we're covering a lot of that ourselves. These correct. Days, yeah, so correct. we're not even we're not even asked we're not even we've reduced the amount of outside spend. Right from Vendetti for like what I would call ancillary trips. Right. 
But I mean, to your point, you're saying that 97 percent would be predictable, but we're seeing these massive shifts. For, no, for the Vendetti contract. That's why. Yeah. yeah. So that's, for, for so that's Vendetti, the Vend Vendetti contract is probably the most predictable piece. Right. The audit district is probably the least predictable. Yeah. And I'd say the second least predictable is our in-town special ed because that can vary greatly over the course right. of the year. So that's where I'd like to see where. Okay, we know the predictability of our Vendetti contract, but where's where is all the extra cost coming? I think like which bucket, ninety percent of the conversation I think that we have regarding budget is out of district spend. I mean, yeah. so um, w all right, so we have one hundred and two kids, right? You're talking. So, in, so, so I'm clarifying. Yeah, so let me clarify. See, again, so, yeah. that's what so I'm saying. There's, there's, there's a so lot of different buckets that we yeah, yeah so that we need to really consider and think about, and, and I kind of understand it, but I want to be able to speak to it. I think I know what you're getting at, Chris, and I think if Jim and I sit down, yeah. even if Jim doesn't come back, I think I can put, to, maybe yeah. Wen and I Wen can join too, yeah. we can put something together that kind of visualizes it yeah. and talks about, like, I think the, the, the different categories and what they cost. Right, and then... that's what you're looking for. Exactly, and then where we started the year and where we ended the year too, right? So okay. we, we're seeing... We're seeing those budget transfers at the end of the year, right? In the, I think in the tune of almost eight hundred thousand dollars last year. But I don't, and and I think we were all like, okay, we got to put the money there. We didn't really get into the specifics of why, where, where did that eight hundred thousand dollars need to go? Which buckets were we short on? Maybe it was one bucket, maybe it was ten. Yeah. But I think that that's why I'd like to see that kind of that breakdown pie chart wise of all the different expenditures. Vendetti out of districts, uh, district, you know, in districts, uh, sped transportation again, and then see where, where, where were the, were the shortfalls? Okay, I think that would be beneficial, at least from my standpoint, <coughs> um, to see. Um, and then also with that, knowing that you know, you do have uh, the circuit breaker, and then how does the circuit breaker like what? Of those buckets, does the circuit breaker really offset? So, you know, that it's not offsetting our yellow bus with Vendetti, but it is offsetting our spread transportation. But is it in district, out of district? So again, yeah, those okay, kind we can, of and we can specifics. I can highlight that because yep. there is a lot of variables there in terms of like yep. what our operating costs are for in town. But then circuit breaker is only applied to out of district sped transportation right. and tuition. Yep. So, so we can highlight that for you. Um, yeah. And for the team, so that everyone can see, you know, where the budget impacts are and how it falls out. Yeah, because with, like I said, with that, if it is the out of district uh, sped that that circuit breaker is offsetting, it's like okay, then if how you know what was our shortfall there? Was it only a dollar or was it a million dollars? Right? Yeah, you know, we don't you know, we don't have that information. Right. So, so I'd, I'll, and I'd I'll like to have that information. We'll have to pull the circuit breaker money yeah. together too to see how yeah. it was applied. I think that would be beneficial from the overall scope of everything. Okay. And I think I can speak for probably everyone even paying attention at home that the transportation is a much more highly complex piece than most people think like it's a bus. You just, you pay for a bus. This is a lot more. And um, Jim, I don't want to put you on the spot, but last time we talked, um, you mentioned a lot about how there's stuff federally and at the state level that is completely out of our control and every town's control that's driving up cost too. Can you touch on, um, I'm, the, the law is, is escaping me right now, but they recently changed it to where if somebody starts a school year in district and then oh, gets placed so out of district, we still have to help, I believe, with that. So you're referring to McKinney-Vento, which is back to right? homeless. So yeah, so for example, you have a student that starts in Milford um, who becomes displaced and is homeless, moves to Millbury. Um, if they are registered, during the school year, um, the MD law allows them the option to come back to the district, uh, the originating district, and the originating district and the forwarding district split the cost on that. Right. Um, in some case, so that and it's a cost share um, with you know just say for example with uh, Grafton. So Grafton's going to pick up half the cost. We're going to pick up half the cost. Right. So you are going to see that when you have a um, you know a uh, I guess a rising. MV population, you know, it, it increases the risk of uh, folks moving from one shelter system to the next, um, which then increases the risk of having uh, modified transportation. Anything? No? Anything else? Okay. Oh, Robin's good. Yeah, go ahead. 
So just one other thought when we're looking at this data. So, and this is more projecting out to when we're thinking about the budget. So the recommendations Chris had, I thought, were really great. Like looking at the different buckets, where the money, the flow in and flow out of money, right? What is um, Circuit Breaker break, bringing in? What are we putting out? But then projecting for next year, especially, you know, I know last meeting we talked about adding a van to the capital plan to replace one that we need to replace. I also want us to keep in mind, we're looking at like 102 students in district. We're servicing them. Are we servicing them effectively? And by that, I mean, not only are we driving them to school, are we driving them to school on time? Are they staying till the end of the day? So I think this is more a future item to talk about when we're talking about budget and even maybe for a budget subcommittee. But I just want to make sure when we're presenting data, we're not just looking at this is what the costs are, but this is the cost to do everything effectively and make sure that all our kids are getting the full education that they need. Sure. I mean, I think you can either make it a future agenda item or if you'd like to make it a subcommittee, um, I think it would probably be more effective to have a working group. That way we can have more granular dialogue mm -hmm. on, you know, certain bucketed areas. Remind me of the subcommittee piece. I think that's an excellent spot where you can kind of hang out with the, the budget group and, and, and they can uh, mm -hmm. tackle that from yeah. a number standpoint. Um, who wouldn't want to hang out with the budget group? Uh, it's a fantastic, group, fantastic group of people. They, put really, they put spreadsheets the on the big group. wall and everything. It's great. John? No, um, I, I think the, the, the last point is that maybe the, the, the first talking point that I have. Bringing it down to the subcommittee level, I think would be highly productive. I've had some um, extended conversations with Jim about all the, 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 the things that he's talked about tonight and, and, and then some, and I think we've been a little blind to it. We haven't, we haven't had the exposure that we should have had o over the, the past couple of years. And I think, you know, Jim can't sum this up in, in one 20 minute presentation and um, we're never gonna digest in a one 20 minute conversation, but um, I think we have to be much more aware of it. And this was a good start. This is like the starting point. Um, so definitely bring it to the, the, the subcommittee level, but we also haven't had the discussion. They can, this can go up to the subcommittee level too. Some of the things we've talked to about with town council about and, and uh, finance director about contributing to the insurance, the self insurance fund, and you know we we've grown our buses, I guess out of necessity, but we, we've got to be mindful of how it impacts the town overall. Absolutely, and, and the other piece I don't know that we're ready to answer this yet, so I'm just I'll throw it out there, especially for the budget subcommittee to hear. Um, I, for me, the ultimate goal would be when we get to January. Knowing what we know now and the comparatives to the DART district stuff, do we will we be able to get to a point where we're now comfortable to say, okay, here's what transportation typically has been for the new budget year. We need to tack on seven hundred fifty thousand dollars because now we can expect that this piece is going to keep growing. Um, well, I, I think it's important to to, uh, uh, to your point too to see what other other communities are doing. Like yeah. part of the part of the conversation with Marlboro, like she was emphatic about saying that for twenty six, they're going to add four to six percent to their budget for transportation year exactly. over year. So she's like, we are planning for an inflationary growth in spending for this category because this is what that we're That may seeing. not even be enough. Well, I'm, ju I'm just saying <laughs> what she said, and wanna, it may not be enough. I hate to be that guy every time, but... Well, it, it, to, but to, to the point, right, is we've been able to find the money to cover it, but ideally, if we can try to get closer and close the gap, we're getting more accurate at predicting this, we can make sure that we're setting ourselves up because, again, as next year rolls around and maybe the year after if we're tight on budget it would be great if we didn't have to find money somewhere else and we could use that for other other educational pieces so did you have something and that's kind of what she's going through now they, they oh, had sure. to find the yeah. overages you know they had to find money to pay invoices that they had that you know they that weren't in the initial budget yeah and we've been able to the last couple of years but as it gets tighter yeah that's going to be hard same so. same story anything else on transportation i see not all right. Thank you very much. And, and as uh, John said, that's just a start. I've spent probably an hour and <coughs> a half on this topic now over the course of a couple of meetings, and I'm still wrapping my head around it, too. There's so many pieces. So we'll, um, we'll continue the discussion, but thank yeah, you very much for this. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. All right. That moves us to the chairperson update. So I have two very quick things to note here. So um, I've had a couple of discussions over the last week or two um, about meeting minutes with the new town's website um, and the, uh, the ability for notifications. Um, Michael and I were discussing, number one, just why in general 
school committee always seems to be a little bit special when it comes to all the other departments in town and committees and how everything is posted on one side and we have our own side so um, in the middle of discussing that I actually had a uh, contact from the IT director at town hall who said that they're looking to get our stuff onto their website as well so um, I'm in discussion with well, I'm sorry I should say I'm trying to be we've missed quite a few opportunities to connect um, in terms of with the IT director on, on what the process is but I'm just gathering details on what that would look like and then I was going to bring it back to uh, to Kevin and just kind of share the idea but ultimately the idea is to have all of the minutes and agendas in one place our agenda is already there um, just posting the minutes there rather than on our website which puts you into a folder that you have to drill down through to go and find um, seems like it would be easier for the public and for transparency so um, without knowing any complete details it sounds like it might literally be as easy as emailing the town webmaster so um, we'll wait for the details on that and then um, another discussion that I've been having has involved uh, the HR director at town hall and I've, I've spoken with uh, Kevin as well and it's just around whether or not the district and the town combined are properly staffed to support our employees on the HR front. I know last year we talked about adding <coughs> an HR manager and we, we did not include that in the budget. Um, it feels like the necessity is even higher to um, some things that were brought to my attention were simply that um, employees, our employee pool has grown as a district and things that people forget I think a lot of times is when somebody retires they don't fall off the books. <laughs> they stay there and they still have stuff to be managed as well. So um, I would expect that budget season will include at least one position for that. And uh, my goal of having a meeting with Town Hall hopefully next week is to just get an understanding from their perspective what they think we need to be effective. And then we as a committee will have to obviously decide what and how many come budget time. But th the idea is to be prepared in advance so we can have all the data in front of us for January so that's all I have for those two pieces if, if I can Matt please it's um, you know because my day job is at the town hall I run into the HR director you know uh, frequently there's a lot of things that aren't being done here um, from an HR standpoint that need to be done so this is a necessity I mean we didn't have a choice really given the you know the budget situation we we're in last year to bring right. on an HR director but <coughs> I think we're at the point of no return we need either an HR director here at the school or one that's in the town working for the town but working at the school for the school whatever you want to call it but this is I don't want to gloss over it this there's, there's some significant deficiencies that need to be resolved absolutely yeah, and I, w I will I will say that that piece is what kicked off the initial for anyone who doesn't know the initial discussion with town hall and and um, and that was a very similar discussion that I had with the uh, with the HR director too, I don't necessarily think that the committee cares if it's our hire or theirs. I think what we're trying to realize is we have, I think I was told 70% of the employees and there's between us and them, four people handling 800 something town employees. So I don't even know if I have that number in time. We're right? pretty close so, to 900 or so. Sorry, so then it's even more, we're probably yeah, over it's, it's it's a thousand town employees. And, and, so. and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that anybody was uh, remiss or deficient in, in their responsibilities here. We just don't have the staff in place to handle it. it no, is yeah, the, it's, is the overwhelming. It's exactly. We we overgrew consensus. our staffing and we didn't keep it up. So we need to fix the problem and that's what we're working on here. So um, I believe we're trying for a meeting next week, but obviously when you stretch it out to five or so departments, now it gets a little complicated. So we'll see what happens there and hopefully I'll have a better update, uh, maybe some data for the next meeting. All right, that takes us to the policy review. These are second readings. Um, we have purchasing policy, which is file DJ, and the smoking policy, which is ADC. Are there any um, additional comments? This is the second reading, so if anybody has anything to adjust or comment on, now would be a good time for that. I don't know, yeah, you're on policy. I keep looking at you like you're oh, yeah. <laughs> You've already read this 37 times, I'm sure. Maybe 36. I'll give you guys a minute to, uh, to look it over. And then 
if there are no um, no thoughts or comments on those for the second reading, I obviously will entertain a motion to adopt both. So moved. Chris. I'll second. Motion by Chris and second by Brendan to adopt both policy DJ for purchasing and ADC for smoking. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. We will be punting the uh, bullying policy. Understood. <coughs> so we're moving on to first readings for policies D, J, E for pure procurement requirements and B, G, P for policy adoption. You guys have anything you want to say about those? Did we talk we about talk procurement? Pro procurements. Um, no. Yeah, so no to that. Is that new? So maybe skip over B also. All right. Yeah, yeah. So we just on policy? Yeah. All right. So yeah. we'll, we will, all right. Policy about policy. All right. <laughs> yeah. Sounds very productive. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so the policy adoption, um, I reviewed, or well, we, we reviewed our, how we do policies and adopt. You know, I know we have readings, which sometimes slows us down for when we want to change, like, a typo, et cetera. Um, so looked into that policy, which was written in 1975, and not really updated much after that. Um, so... The MSAC has a great model policy, which is what this is, basically. Um, what it does is it allows us to um, adopt a policy in one meeting, and it follows a framework of a um, th agenda items. It requires that the policy is given to the committee ahead of time, and then on the agenda, there has to be two, two, two agenda items, one for discussion, and then one for the act action, which would be the vote. Um, this does not mean it has to be done in one meeting, uh, it just gives us the option of doing it in one meeting. So if we want to, you know, move this over from multiple meetings, we can. Um, but it gives us more flexibility. And like I said, this is a standard MASC model policy. So, questions? Thank you for kind of working through that. And it sounds like yeah, and you're also replacing two policies, bringing it down to one on a single page, which I know you like. Um, so no, no real like uh, questions or comments other than, or no questions, just comment other than is, yeah, looks like it helps streamline the process, so definitely in favor. John? Yeah, I'd be in favor of this as well. I know we've had some discussions here where we would have liked to just adopt a change in a policy at, that, at one meeting and, you know, I've objected saying our policy says we can't. It, I thought I was against the change. But that's the rules we had in place. So I'm in favor of you know modifying it needs to be more effective. Excellent. I mean I would say obviously from this from the standpoint of what they said, I, I agree too. I mean, there are some things where I think if it's you know student body focused, perhaps we just choose to put it out there and give the public a chance to see it if they want to see it too. But for a lot of these things, um, especially for stuff that impacts this board specifically, it's easier to just move on with our lives. Yeah, I would just reiterate, well, I forget which one of these guys said it, but it doesn't mean we have to do it in one night, but right. we can. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. We can move on from uh, first reading. And uh, for the record, one more time, we just reviewed first reading for file BGB for policy adoption. The other ones were passed over. So we'll move on to the report of the superintendent of schools. All right. So at the September 5th meeting, Dr. Island presented the information that will be included in the Educational questionnaire in the Chapter 74, Vocational Technical Educational Viability Documentation. We plan to submit these as well as the enrollment information during the, the third week of October. Um, they're due October 30th. Today I want to focus on the enrollment information. And th this is actually kind of one of, probably one of two critically important pieces for the, um, for the eligibility period paperwork we're going to be putting in. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of information, and I'm going to talk to you about the handouts I gave you, too. And I'm kind of looking for feedback tonight from you, and I'll be looking for feedback, I think, as well, from the, from, from the building committee. Um, our enrollment has been steadily increasing over the past de decade, and this may not be reflected in building permits or new housing complexes. And I used to say also birth rates, but that's no longer true. Um, and you're, going to, you're going to see that in a second. Um, much of our growth is from families moving into the community from other communities within Massachusetts, from other states, and from other countries. Not only has our enrollment been increasing, but the composition of our enrollment has also changed significantly. <coughs> this has also required us to significantly adjust programming and services to meet both the growing student population and the changing needs of our students and families. 
Additionally, our enrollment can be dynamic within the course of a school year, which is not always captured in the October 1st SIMS data collection. That is why we'd like to explore, and we've talked about this and voted on this previously, a grade 7 through 12 complex, a grade 8 through 12 complex, and the current 9 through 12 configuration. We would also like to explore the feasibility of adding Chapter 74 programs under each of these configurations. And it's also important to note, particularly that Dr. Masterson was here tonight, that we're going to keep the preschool as part of the high school complex. That's, that's, that's part of the plan. Um, in 2018, we worked with NESDAC to complete a pre-K through 12 school facilities best educational use study. Within that study were enrollment projections, which we also received from NESDAC annually, that were off significantly because Milford is such a unique community. We, we provided an attachment as part of the submission, and that's this page right here with the color coordinated piece, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And Dr. Otland put this together for us. Um, NESDAC is widely recognized as an expert in enrollment projections, and their methodology is very accurate for most communities. Milford has been an outlier for the past decade, and using traditional measures of student enrollment growth or decline has not yielded accurate results. And this is what this piece of paper kind of indicates. For example, the enrollment projections for K-12 were off by 10% for the 23-24 school year back in 2018, 14% for 7 through 12, 14.58% for 8 through 12, and 16.34% for grades 9 through 12 for the 23-24 school year. And, and we've talked about this before, but Milford High School is, I think, in the top 1% of growth for high schools in, you know, during this time period as well. Now, this is, this is the new wrinkle that's really been happening the last couple of years that I, I think we really need to focus on. The birth rates in the community also seem to be increasing over the last several years. In 2016, that's this document right here, the, the kind of the tables that are, these are the tables I created that are a little less fancy. Um, in 2016, births in Milford totaled 354 per year, which has been pretty consistent with our kindergarten classes, give or take. In 2021, that rose to 384, 414 in 22, 459 in 23, and so far through the end of September of 24, the total is 328, which is again, if it kind of stays consistent, trending over 400 births for the year, um, if, that, if, that, if the birth rate kind of continues at a, at a relatively stable pace. This indicates that our kindergarten classes will be increasing in the coming years. And I don't have to say this to you guys, but you already know it, because you already know it, we're already pressed for space across the district. The enrollment trends for most districts and communities in Massachusetts are slowly declining. Milford is one of the handful of communities that is experiencing both population growth and a rapid shift in demographics, particularly among families who pro whose primary, English is, or primary language is not English and for English learners. So let me go down to the anticipated design enrollment. So one of the things that we're, con we're considering is redistricting as part of the feasibility study. And we've li we'd like to explore, again, bringing the seventh and eighth grades of the Milford High School complex. This will also have an impact on the schools below um, Milford High School and will result in redistricting at Woodland and Stacy for certain, possibly also at our K-2 schools. Again, the impact on these schools would depend on which option Milford ultimately decides on if we bring 7th you know, over, 7th and 8th over, and if we don't do anything and stay with 9 through 12, there's probably not going to be a redistricting happening. Based on the NESDAC projection from the 23-24 school year, so last school year, the total of projected enrollment in 2028 for grades 7 through 12 in the Milford High School proje Complex project including pre-K, would be 2,424. Now, in the 23-24 enrollment projections, and this is the very important part, and I want you to, you know, if you've been tuning me out, listen carefully at this point, because it's, 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 it's an important piece of information. The enrollment projections NESDEC um, had is 394 births in, in 22, 366 births in 23, and 371 births in 24. And again, I just listed the actual births, which were 414, 459, and we're on pace for over 400 again for this current year. Um, this is a difference of 14.8%. Very similar to the, the percentage that were off for the projections that I talked about initially 
from that 2018 study. If you account for increasing, increasing birth rates, the proposed projects, and Milford's trend of increasing enrollment beyond birth rates, we would need more space for additional students for this project. That is why I'm proposing 2,782 students for a 7 through 12 model. And obviously, um, if we were to you know, go to 8 through 12 or 9 through 12, those would be correspondingly lower, taking up a class for each one. Um, again, reduced by one or two grades, respectively. How I came up with the 2,782 number is I basically, it's, it's pretty simple math. I took the projections from NESDAQ and added 14.8% to them, which I think is very defensible. Now, what I want you to think about, and I think we can even make the decision, you know, you could talk about, hey, that sounds great, or hey, could you, could you justify going even higher? Um, you know, we have to make the decision by October 30th, basically. Um, so the data is telling us that, and NASDAQ is increasing our enrollment finally in, in their projections because they've seen, the, they've seen the increase. What's new is the, the birth rate has increased beyond what they've expected, which, which has been pretty consistent. You know, our kindergarten classes have varied a little bit, and we've had bigger classes and smaller classes, but it's always been in that like 330 to 360, 370 range for the most part. And now we're seeing birth rates going above 400 for three consecutive years. Two consecutive years, likely a third consecutive year. So that's, that's my recommendation for this project based on looking at our historical data, our projections from NASDAQ, and the percentage that they've been off the last few years for birth rates. One thing I just want to add, because um, we were talking about this before the meeting, the, when he speaks of births in town, he's talking about births to residents of the town specifically, so. Yeah, there's more, there's more deliveries happening at <laughs> Milford, Milford Hospital than the numbers that I'm saying. This is disaggregated data for, for Milford residents. That's an important point. I mean, we, we, we might, I would, I would have just assumed that because not every town has a hospital and there's birth rates for every town, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. I mean. Well, when I saw it, the numbers initially, is, John, my eyes popped out of my head because I was like, oh my God, but then, then they that was probably probably disaggregated worth data. Worth clarifying that. Yeah. Question. Uh, well, first, um, again, Milford's special. You know, the country as a whole, birth rates are going down and ours are going up, so this is interesting. Um, but I, you know, I noticed here, we talk about 9 through 12, 8 through 12, and 7 through 12. Um, I thought we were, I guess, we, we voted or were clear on 8 through 12 and 7 through 12. So I you suggested that we add a, a, a 9 through 12 off for the feasibility? We, we voted had, for we had three. We had three. We did? We did. Yeah, we had three. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at six options, basically. 7 through 12, 8 through 12, and 9 through 12, each configuration with potentially a chapter 74. Okay. So um, I was here, what was it, five years ago? We sat over in, in the media center next door, wherever it is, with NASDAQ here, or one of the small rooms there. We knew their predictions were just way off base because we knew that we're an aberration. The statistics weren't going to support what was actually happening in town. But they had to do their, they had to have justification for their, their projections, which they do. And we're gonna need justification for our adjusted projections, which you've provided. So yep. um, I would definitely support that. I, could, I, I can't say we're gonna add 30% because, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's. I, I can't justify that. No, the, the the, there's, there's nothing to back it up. So um, I do support everything you've presented to me. To John's point, you know, with that backup, obviously, NESDEC is the, you know, the company that... They're the gold standard. The, the gold standard, for right? For projection. And has, I guess... Um, and for most towns, they're correct. Right. You know, that, that's actually, that's 100%. Has there been true. any conversation with the MSBA on what sort of documentation they're going to require to kind of say, well, NESDEC's been wrong, you know, so are, are, are we going to be able to just say... We're going to go by 14% because they've been wrong by 14%, or do we need more data to, to backfill why NASDAQ was wrong? No, I, I think this is what we need because it's, it's you know, the, the additional, like the unknown is always who's moving into the community. Mm -hmm. And that's been kind of like, that's been like the variable that we've all wrestled with in terms of like, hey, staffing, space. But now we have concrete evidence that birth rates are going up as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we can make that, 
I don't want to call it an amorphous argument because it's, it's driven a lot of the enrollment. But we, we know people are moving into the community at higher rates than they're moving into other communities because our enrollment has gone up because of it. Now we have that additional factor of birth rates, which we have hard data on to support. Like, you know, we, we know that there's going to be an increase in our kindergarten classes in a few years because the birth rates have gone up. And we know that based on like, you know, all the factors that kind of as kids go through the process, we know our class sizes are going to be bigger going all the way through. Yeah, so besides birth rates, are, are we looking at, you know, our um, housing inventory? We are, yeah. That's, you know, that's obviously part of the, yeah, 40, that's, 40 Bs are a big one. And, and, you know, the 40 Bs that have just come online, yeah. what that impact is. And, and John, I think... I've right, been harassing John in the past few yeah, weeks. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I think so. there's four 40 B applications Correct. in the pipeline right now. Correct. So, which obviously could have a, a more more impact. So, I guess and I'm incorporating that into the um, yeah into the, so they ask, they actually ask for um, there's basically a page where it goes through like I think it's like the last ten years mm -hmm. and the number of permits for single family and multifamily. John provided all that. I've gotten uh, you know other more you know other information on more detailed information, but other information from a couple other folks in town, including Jerry, who's been working on the 40B projects during the week, um, and that'll be incorporated in too. So. Um, you know, they have a formula attached to that that we really can't. There's, there's, um, I, I forget who does it, but there's a formula based on like the number of one, two, and three bedroom houses. There's right. a certain um, number of kids per, you know, per unit basically. Correct. There, yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a formula that they use. It's like an accepted practice, mm -hmm. and I, I don't have the, the equation, but that's, that's how they do it. Right. So, it, it so we're incorporating all yeah. that in. So it's short answers, we're incorporating all that. Right. In. Well, short answers beyond just birth rates, we do have other Correct. factors that we can utilize to help bolster why we, we're seeing a uh, student population increase and why we anticipate that, in, that increase going forward. Yeah, and we're going to have clearly more bedrooms moving forward, which is going to be more students. Mm -hmm. yep. yes. I think that was a good point to make, Chris. I think I'm concerned, obviously. I mean, I, I'll take your word for their projections being accurate elsewhere, but if you just look at the 9 through 12 for 2028, they're saying that we're only growing 178 students from last year until 2028, which right. we could grow yeah. by February. Right. Um, so I think it's important to, to understand how we can attack this in terms of convincing the MSBA that that's not going to work for us. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, the goal is and, it's, and it's not to disparage NESDAQ. We're, we're no. an outlier community. Yeah. You know, right. and they're, they're very accurate in most other places. I think there's probably 10 communities, maybe 12 communities they struggle with because there's a lot more variables at play, mm -hmm. like in Milford. And someone has shared, uh, one of you guys, I think, that the projection that we started with when Woodland started to the number of kids that were there when we opened was, we were technically over the initial enrollment projection, right? And that's something that, given our growth trends, we, we can't be over. <laughs> Yeah. here and be out of space 10 years into a building that we need to last 50 years. 10 years, day one. 10 years, day one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess with, with that, have any successful bids with the MSBA included a district like ours where we've, we've been the outlier and, and what was their percentage? I don't know if you can answer that. I, I, I don't have that okay. data. Um, or if we can ask them about that. But I, but I have been working with James Reefstall, who's yeah. our consultant, who's got a kind of a more global picture in this process, and, sure. and he felt like the methodology we're looking at um, sound. was was sound. Okay. You know, in terms of, uh, I was on a call with you know Jonathan Bruce and James and mm -hmm. Josh Allen, the high school principal, mm -hmm. and you know we kind of talked it through, and you know we, we want to start at a number we feel good about because yeah. you know it's probably not going to go up; it's likely to go down from whatever we we project. So. Sure. Um, I'm going to take a look at the data a couple more times. I'm going to have Josh take a look at it, James. You guys are all welcome to look at it, too. Um, but I think what I'm putting forth is pretty pretty sound in terms of just based on the, the difference between the birth rates and what we've been seeing mm -hmm. just in the past you know decade, basically. Yeah. I mean, we all know that it's going to happen. It's just how, how, do, how do we project that so it, it's good backup data for the MSBA, and they, they believe us. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. We're not telling stories out of school. These babies right. are are being born a yeah. few miles down, or maybe a mile and a half down the road. Right. All right. Any other questions on that? I see. Thank you. For that. If anybody has any offline feedback or wants to engage in the conversation or wants to talk through the data, at all, I'm, I'm happy to do that with anybody. Do we need to vote on this? Uh, you know, you can you can vote on it. I think. I think we should. I think we should too. I just tell the, the building committee. Where'd I put it? 
to accept the recommendation. Yes. All right, so we're looking for a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation of proposing the enrollment at 2,782 for the project. That's correct. So of accepting his projected enrollment? Yeah. I'll second it. Or do, is that, sorry, I thought you were my, I'll motion that. Please do. All right, motion by Brendan, second by Robin. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. All right, thank you. All right. That brings us to the report of the school business administrator. gifts today. I have one from the Foundation for Metro West in the amount of $488.50 and the purpose is for grade 7 math after school tutoring club. And the other is also from Foundation for Metro West. It is ITESL Carnegie and the amount of this is $18,767.65. Uh, that's from Carnegie, right? Yeah. Any more information on that? Yeah, that's for um, 11 of these. Oh, okay. Yep, I see them. Monitors to be put in classrooms at the high school. 11 65-inch LED panels and 11 uh, heavy-duty in mounts. In installation, too. Yeah, that's great. All right. Motion to accept the two gifts. Motion by Michael. Second. Second by Chris. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> All right, that brings us to our third swing out of the consent agenda. Does anybody have anything they want to pull out of the list that you currently see? Um, I do. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. What do you got? Same, same, same question on a warrant. The transportation director still being paid out of the revolving account? Anybody have an answer for that one? Is the transportation director still being paid out of the revolving account? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, last subcommittee meeting we have discussed, and I followed up with the email. Oh, so I remember. I remember. Yeah. I just don't think that's that's proper management. So I want to pull that out separately and vote the warrant separate from the rest of the consent agenda. Let me just pull that out. All right. So tonight's consent agenda is going to include the approval of minutes from the September nineteenth, two thousand twenty-four regular session. Professional development, I did not total that, but that is listed in your packet. Mm -hmm. and, I'm sorry, the total of that is $26,865.82. Mm -hmm. And then the acceptance of grants, which totals $444,995. A motion to accept the consent agenda. Motion by Michael. Second by Robin. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Right, now we will move to the approval of warrant. We have nine warrants in the amount of $1,345,378.38. All right. Motion to approve. Motion by Michael, second by Brendan. Is there any discussion on that further? I guess yeah, it should be John. Has some well, I guess to John's point, when we're going to kind of that's going to be a budgetary um, a budget subcommittee discussion. Oh, I so, understand. So um, at the, well, I mean, I, I may have cut one short. I didn't mean to, but um, in hindsight, that not a, all of us were at that meeting. So at the budget subcommittee meeting, we. We charged somebody with finding out whether or not paying the transportation director out of a revolving account was legal. When reached out to somebody at um, the state or what, which, whatever organization. Uh, the, our, what um, I mean, Tracy? Tracy Novick at MSC. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. MSC. Yes, right. So right. Tr Tracy, right. Tracy sent back uh, to when and went forward to the budget subcommittee um, a list of which funds can be taken from which revolving accounts and such. And so the consensus from Tracy is that it's legal to pay the transportation director out of the community use revolving account. Uh, if it's legal, and if we take that as 
fact, I still don't believe it's appropriate, so I'm not going to support the warrant. I'm not going to vote to approve the warrant. I appreciate that explanation. That's why. So I'm just trying to figure out, yeah, what and basically. I, what I do the apologize next steps because about, yeah. I knew what one was saying, and I didn't take it in the context of the whole room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you haven't come up with a plan yet, have we? Or is it just still so, so get through this year? There's there's no plan to change at this point. But you know, it's it's always I, like everything else is up, up for discussion. Because it's not budgeted in this year's budget, so uh, we'll have to review the end of the year spending versus budget, and then make the decision there if we can absorb the, the salary. It, if we can, it's just a, simply a journal entry to bring it into the budget, and we have to add this budget item for next year. So what you're suggesting is that we can do a journal entry towards the end of the year yes. to adjust. Right. thoughts on that all right so we had a motion by Michael and a second by Brendan to approve the warrant all in favor all opposed okay. awesome thank you <laughs> <laughs> just giving you a second I know, that doesn't happen often all right thank you everybody should we put that on the next agenda to talk about do you want to put on the next agenda do you guys want to Take this up We're for another. We're going to talk about it every, uh, what do you call every it? Every two consent, weeks. Consent agenda. Yeah. Well, I think when we get the future agenda, as we can. Yeah, I'd rather pull it out for next meeting so we can actually have a full okay. discussion. All right. So yeah. let me uh, just jump <coughs> to subcommittee updates quickly. Does anybody have anything about that? Yeah, quick. Uh, quick. So uh, a couple weeks ago, the, um, the building committee met, uh, town hall, a pretty quick meeting. Um, just kind of went over. Kind of basic stuff, right, Mike? I'm trying to, there was nothing. Yeah, it was uh, 28 minutes. 28, 28 minutes yeah. long of a meeting, so really not a lot. But they are, we are going to meet consistently uh, month to month. Um, you know, over the next couple months, with a little bit more depth in, into that, um, which kind of leads towards what we discussed in uh, facilities, uh, which we had uh, last Tuesday. Um, Brookside punch list is still ongoing, but we're we're moving through <laughs> that. Oh. You know. Um, but again, it's it's something that I keep discussing. Uh, there was some some circumstances that happened that caused some of the, the things to lag. Uh, we have also been in touch with Brian Murray just so we had held back funds, so we just wanted Brian to understand that, and he was okay with it. Just so we didn't, you know, all of a sudden he gets a letter saying, "Well, why are these funds been withheld?" So we did that. Um, woodland turf netting, uh, as we had discussed in the past, Carlos got those. Uh, quotes John and I were able to review that it's a single quote it's within the scope of the budget so we told them to proceed on with a uh, vote for that um, for the uh, let's see what else um, we, had, we talked a little bit about kind of the focus of the subcommittee um, we can, you can we'll go over in the, the meeting minutes the next time we, if anybody wants to um, and then basically the other one was just the um, kind of within the eligibility period we asked Kevin just to kind of come in up with a few dates obviously tonight was the educational profile um, and then from there obviously that will work through uh, the uh, building committee uh, general committee then we also have um, the maintenance and capital plan so that still is in development Kevin will bring it to the subcommittee. We'll look through it, and then we'll bring it to this committee. So, but that deadline being that it is in uh, January 28th is coming fast. So, so, Mr. Chairman, just keep that in mind that we will have to have that on our agenda probably in November. November. So, if we can review that in November, and then the uh, building committee can look at it in December, and then it can be finalized and submitted at the end of January. Well, again, yeah. all right. Anyone else? Michael. Um, budget subcommittee met a couple weeks ago. It seems like forever. Um, we started our uh, for our first meeting in a long time, so we're just getting geared up. Um, the next meeting will be next week. We'll be uh, working with the uh, administration and budget subcommittee on the school committee budget guidelines for 2025, which I think Greg. And Kevin has gotten a copy now from when. Um, I did. They're yes. pretty simple. Yeah. Um, straightforward. So that will be presented next school committee meeting. Um, 
And then um, we'll, I think we'll put transportation on the budget subcommittee as well too. Yeah, and we had a policy meeting today. Um, we're cranking through some policies. Thank you for voting in the policy adoption. That'll help us move policies through a bit quicker and a bit more efficiently. So, um, yeah, we're, what are we talking about today? Oh, we talked about bullying. Um, so that'll be hopefully next meeting, uh, next month. Um, we'll, we'll bring it to, to the full committee. The focus on, I think, the, the policy of the past meetings has been to, to remove procedures from policies and keep the policies just policies. We've found that there there's some policies that have like, you know, their their full documents and their like a procedure to how, right? And so we're we're focusing on removing those, giving them back to the administration so they can go make the changes day to day and week to week so it doesn't have to come back to the full committee. So that's been a, a big focus. Uh, trying to get school committee out of the, the how and get us more focused on the, the why. Anything else? No. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move on to a future agenda items. So you have a copy of the year-long agenda um, linked. There's only one minor edition of a report on the uh, dual language program in February, and there was one date change. And uh, based on the discussion we just had, I also have for future agenda items to uh, separate out the warrant as to a, a separate piece so we can have any active discussions we need there, and transportation going to budget subcommittee discussion anything else for future agenda items yeah just when we get down to that conversation um, about the transportation the transportation director's salary and just what other um, potential uh, uh, buckets like we always say like keep saying that buckets that we could bring money over there right I know we're using the revolving from the community use but there is the uh, the school choice right so just off the top of my head where where is school choice is that a potential you know things of that nature so okay and I assume we'll see that in our budget update next month too so we can make sure that that's included anything else I have an item that's not a future agenda that we need to, we can talk about Super quick. Um, we did vote in September for the education profile to be 7 through 12 and 8 through 12. So just make that clear. And in, in, in here it's now 9 through 12, 7 through 12, and 8 through 12. I, I think we, we had all three. Yeah, yeah I, I think we had all three. I Maybe. just pulled up the minutes. And the motion I made only had those two. All right. I think we have to look at it as a 9 through 12. I think, yeah, I think, it, was, I think it was always. I'm not saying, I'm just saying what we voted on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think what we voted on was to, to include also the, include yeah. to our current model. What day was it? I mean, I don't think anybody fifth, voted right. to preclude I'll, um, 9 through 12. Yeah. I'll, I'll take on checking the video to make sure that what we have um, matches. Sure the reason I'm bringing it up because this will drive the feasibility study. Absolutely. Right? So it's going to drive it. Are we going to look at four. three different options or two different options, right? So, so we're actually why. looking at four or six. Huh? Because it's we're looking at chapter four, seventy-four six. now for each, yeah. each each configuration. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think my understanding sure. walking away from is we we're looking at six, six. seven options. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Three grade, three different grade configurations with each one having a chapter seventy-four component. I, I think right. that vote was to expand the yeah. options I thought from it was nine to twelve, to eight, and include yeah. eight to twelve and seven to twelve. Not prohibit nine to twelve or preclude nine to twelve. I'll, I'll yeah. review it tomorrow and send out. Yeah. Um, informational. If you want to put it on the next agenda, right? I mean, the next if we agenda, need, if we'll, we need to we'll discuss it to make it formal. Nope. The good news is the motion did say, and any other options that benefit the project. So there, you there is a you know <laughs> option there. So I, I just want to make safety that, net's there. The safety net is there. <laughs> good, um, but but I just wanted to make sure that you know that said three. We did tell you know I want to make sure we're all. I, I will say if we have there's any any discrepancy there, we should revote it in October. Just yeah. the second meeting yeah. because I have to submit that with the yeah. documentation. At okay. the end of our show. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we actually did because we voted tonight for this, so that's what precede what we voted before. They're not in sync now. All right. So they didn't mention the American. American. <laughs> <laughs> we just conferred what? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Are we, are we good to adjourn? I don't know what we're good at right now. <laughs> yeah. Anything else for future agenda items? That's a good place to stop. Okay. So <laughs> there's, there's nothing else. We do not have executive session tonight. Um, so I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion, motion by Chris, second by John. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Good.